My name is John Dickinson. I am the Director of Technology at SwiftStack, and I am also the OpenStack Swift Project Technical Lead. And today, I'm going to give you a little 101 on Swift. So if you are not sure what Swift is, how it's put together, or what it can be used for, or how you could make use of it, then you're in the right place right now. So that's great. Uh, today, I want to go over basically what Swift is trying to do, who's using it, uh, tell you a little about, uh, about some use cases that I think are pretty exciting, and then go talk about the architecture a little bit, kind of a high-level overview of how the code is put together and how it works. Uh, some of the technical details of it, I'll touch a little bit on some deployment details, and then if we've got enough time after all of that, we'll have uh, some time for questions. So, with that being said, uh, one thing I know that I looked at the schedule for the summit and just searched for Swift, because that's what I do, is a Swift PTL. And there were a lot of cool sessions. And one of, uh, we're at the end, and so there are still a few more sessions left today if you're looking for more information on, on uh, Swift itself. Um, I myself, actually, this is the first of three talks I'm giving today, so uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, but uh, I'm talking about Swift 101 right now. Uh, immediately after this, in here, there's uh, some very interesting use case of uh, Swift with very large dis globally distributed clusters. Uh, building applications with Swift, that would be more along the lines of, I'm writing an application, I don't really care about the storage infrastructure, but I want to use Swift uh, and write something on top of it. Uh, we've got a Pack 12 I'm going to touch on them a little bit today. They are going to uh, be telling you a little bit about their use case. Uh, extensibility in Swift is about how you can actually add your own functionality and integrate Swift a little bit uh, with different, uh, in different ways. And then uh, tomorrow, uh, there is a full day workshop. It uh, actually starts with nine, uh, with Time Warner Cable talking about their whole OpenStack deployment. And then it's starting at 10, full day free workshop about in very, very uh, high level of detail uh, how Swift works, you can deploy it and run it on uh, yourself. You'll have, uh, you can get it installed and, and run it. Play with it, uh, see how failure handling works, see how things work together. Talk in detail about building uh, production clusters and what those look like. like. What does the networking look like? What do you put in your rack? And, and things like that. That is in the Hyatt Hotel, free tomorrow. Uh, I've got some information uh, over here. If you'd like uh, something to take with you to remind you, then uh, please come pick that up. That is very close uh, in the in the uh, in the Hyatt tomorrow. So we're at the Palais de Congress, and the uh, Hyatt Hotel is in the same building, basically. Also, if you want a book, uh, I think the expo hall is just about closed. Uh, if it's not closed when we're done here, then you can go by the SwiftStack booth and pick up a book if there's still some there. If not, go to SwiftStack.com/book, and you can get an O'Reilly book on all kinds of the same sort of stuff, but that way you can have a dead tree version to walk around and read and uh, learn all you need to know. So with that being said, why are we here? Uh, why, why do we even have this thing called Swift to start with? It is one of the founding projects of OpenStack, uh, but why, did, why is that important and what, is, what makes it up? So the reality on why we did that, uh, why Swift is here, was really conceptualized and brought to the forefront, at least in the technology world, by Amazon. Uh, their S3 product was one of their first pieces of AWS that they deployed. And it basically means that you've got this extremely good way to store a lot of data cheaply. And it's a different model than we're generally used to. Uh, Specifically, it means that you don't have to think about your storage anymore, and then you're doing it in the on-demand pricing. It kind of, although the the terms have been around for a, a while, it basically you know AWS kicked off the whole cloud thing. So there, it, it's it's been around a while. It's thing, things we've uh, been adapting to, and that uh, kicked off in the minds of a lot of people who are running and deploying. Um, IT infrastructure, okay, this is something we need to consider, and how do we do that? So speaking of the IT infrastructure, they saw this happening, and they saw this change. They heard this demand from people who were uh, building applications and running stuff that they wanted this new kind of consumption model. And they themselves, the IT people, if you're running IT um, for a company, then you see that you want to take advantage of 
the economies of scale. You want to consolidate. You want to get rid of vertical silos. You want to be able to manage your storage pool. But you'd really like to do that with no hardware lock-in. You'd like to take advantage of uh, commodity hardware. And you'd like to, of course, do it cheaply. But it needs to be durable. And so you need to be able to support a lot of different things. Rather than saying, I want to stand up a silo for this application, and then later on I'm going to stand up another uh, silo of storage for this application, let's put those together and support the different use cases that we have. So the reason we need that is because data is exploding. And that's, that's the canonical up and to the right graph of we're getting a lot of data everywhere. Um, so there's a couple of ways you can actually solve that. If you look at the traditional way that people were solving this, it was go buy a hard drive, and then when that fills up, you go buy another hard drive, and then when that fills up, you go buy another hard drive, and then you realize this is not going to be a very scalable model, and then one of your hard drives fails, and so you, and you, need hard, you, you decide, I'm going to go buy a RAID card, and then you go put those together. And the whole thing is you're still, your applications are still having to deal with this massive overflow of data, more and more drives you're having to manage. You have to remember where you put things. You're having to deal with um, all of this concurrency, but you're doing this on top of like POSIX semantics on file systems, and it just it just gets to a pain point that you just really didn't have when a lot of data was measured in terabytes, and when a lot of data starts getting measured in petabytes and beyond, then you're thinking this is really starting to hurt. And 10 hard drives was not hard to manage. 10,000 hard drives is hard to manage. So we need a different way to think about things. We need a different way to consume things. And there's a couple of different ways you can do that. Uh, if you're talking about systems that are spread out because you need failure, you need availability, you need, um, you need to uh, support these kind, of, these kind of concurrent things, you have to have more than one system doing it. So when you're building more th a distributed system, there's a, a rule that basically says that of the three principles of that system, you can choose two of them. And you cannot have three. So either you have to have something that is strongly consistent which means that in the case of failures, the system will not, re will not be available. But it means that any time you ask a question of the system, you're going to be able to get the answer that the whole system knows about right now. On the other end of the things is eventually consistent. And eventually consistent means that even in the, uh, uh, if there is failure in the system, the system is still able to respond, and it will later, eventually, uh, move or uh, uh, resolve the any, any discrepancies in what's been going on in the data, the messages it's received. So generally, to, to simplify it, there strong consistency uh, is something that is really good and actually vitally important for block storage for underlying file systems. Uh, things that you, you don't want to you need to put your database on something that's strongly consistent because you don't want over time something to um, change out from under it and you get corruption and things like that. Eventually, consistent systems are fantastic when you need high availability, and the, the unstructured data that you're storing on top of it isn't really, they're, they're independently, it doesn't matter when I upload a picture, if it happens before or after when you upload a picture, or when server A does a backup compared to server B. So the object itself, the, the data itself, is, is stored correctly, but now you can scale this in such a way that um, you have extremely high availability across your, your distributed system. So that's, that's where Swift lives. It lives in an eventually consistent distributed storage space. And it gives you a really nice things uh, because of that. It gives you the ability to have a globally distributed cluster. It gives you uh, the ability to uh, do this with a simple API, not something that's very, very chatty, like uh, that wouldn't work in a globally distributed scale. You don't want to do SIFs over a continent sort of thing. Um, it's something that uh, allows you to consolidate your storage and offload the hard problems of storage from the application. So you don't have to think about the uh, you know, file system semantics of locking and how do you deal with concurrency and what happens when you have failures and corruption on that. Swift will s store that, or it will take care of that for you. And most importantly, um, at least especially in the context of being here at this, at this event this week, uh, looking at OpenStack. In, me, in my mind, the, the open part is what's really important about that. So you've got an open system that allows you to have full ownership of your data because you know everything that is touching your data. That storage system that's managing it, you have influence and control of, over. Not only can you see your code, but you can get involved in the community and, um, and influence that. And that being said, please submit patches. I would love to have all of your patches for Swift. 
So who's using Swift? Why, if this is so great, who's using it? So there's a lot of companies, and a lot of these are actually everyday names, which is one thing I really like about it. Um, my goal, my vision for Swift, that I've said many times, if you've been to other OpenStack summits and heard me speak, it's, I'll say the same thing. My vision for Swift is that everybody will use Swift every day, whether they realize it or not, which means that when you help their kid with their homework and you go look at Wikipedia, you're using Swift. When you get back to the office next week and you're scanning in your, your receipts for your expense report, I want those to be using Swift because it's unstructured data that grows without bound and needs a lot of uh, uh, concurrency and uh, support of new application models like in the mobile and uh, shared storage and, and all of that sort of thing. When you go deal with banking, when you deal with your document management at your work, uh, when you're dealing with video and watching videos, I want you to be using Swift every day, every, um, um, even if you don't realize it. So let's, let's talk a little bit about some of those use cases. I've got a few um, very specifically that I wanted to highlight. PAC-12, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, is, a, is an organization, a sports broadcasting network um, on the west coast of the United States. Um, so a lot of college football and college sports, uh, things like that. The reality is then that they have their calendars dominated by the uh, school season, the university calendar. So they have a sports season. That this is this is when people play American football, and this is when people play baseball, and this is when people play soccer or football. So they record over 800 sporting events every year, and they need to store this data, and then they are broadcasting that out. So they were running out of space in their SAN. It was rather expensive, and they needed something that was cheaper and that was better, more scalable for them. So they chose Swift to store that, which means that. Every time they store, they, they were able to save money off of uh, moving from their SAN onto uh, Swift for their video storage. And uh, they were able to uh, scale out a, l a lot better and a lot, um, a lot new, I'm sorry, the, uh, they were able to scale, scale out in a graceful manner. They didn't have to worry about downtime um, on upgrades. They didn't have to worry about um, any of that sort of thing. And the really exciting thing I like about this is that when they were using their SAN, they would archive their stuff off onto tape. Well, tape, while it is cheap, it is certainly not available, and certainly not in the sense of, hey, I'd like to watch this old sporting event. Let's watch it right now. Well, if that's on a shelf someplace, even if it's in some sort of tape system, it's the, the latency on reading that data is rather high. The really great thing about them putting all of their stuff into Swift means that now all of their data is highly available, which means that they have not only saved, saved money, but their marginal, and their marginal cost on adding that old archived content into Swift is actually lower than just sticking it off on the shelf, and it actually enables new revenue models for them. So imagine if you were able to say, well, I really like this particular sports team, and I want to go watch some old recording. Well, used to, if that was archived, there's nothing to incentivize Pac-12 to go try to s satisfy your one request. But if it's already in something that's highly available, they can create new revenue models because their storage system is now highly available. And that's something that's actually really exciting to me. It's not just this cost thing, but it's like, we can do new things with our, with our data now that we have a new way to think about it and reason about it um, because the storage system is, uh, is built for that. Time Warner Cable is another use case. They uh, spoke uh, at, on the first keynote uh, on Monday morning, and uh, they're using uh, lots of OpenStack um, all over the, the United States. Uh, they're doing a lot of new and interesting and big things, specifically around video. And they've got the set-top DVR boxes, and they've got to store a lot of that stuff. So they're using Swift for um, a lot of backups uh, in conjunction with some of their OpenStack uh, deployment, uh, their compute deployments. Um, they are uh, doing using Swift as a repository for video. You would imagine that a cable network would probably have a lot of video. And uh, overall, they are able to build new internal applications on that that can then take advantage of, again, the highly available storage. Now, this third one is a name that's not too familiar to a lot of people. Um, it's an American company, and even in the United States, it's not an incredibly popular name. And it's certainly not a technology company. So Bud Van Lines is a moving company, like the big giant trucks. They go to your house. They will pack up everything, put it in the truck, and then move it someplace and unpack it for you. 
So that's interesting. So they're a logistics company. They have some very interesting use cases of what they're doing with their storage. For example, they're taking your things in your house, putting them in a truck, and then going and parking the truck in a warehouse. So it's very important to them that they have 24-7 video surveillance of all of the parking lots and all of the warehouses to make sure that your stuff is secure, physically. Well, all that video has to be someplace. So they are storing all of that video inside of their Swift cluster. Another thing that they're doing, which is very interesting, is they're putting tablet devices inside of all of their trucks. And so when things are packed up, they're able to take a picture if something's damaged. All of that can be put immediately into the Swift cluster from the mobile device, from the field. And more than that, all of their documents can be stored there as well and then accessed on the mobile device. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of Bud Van Lines' employees is here this week, and he was, we were at dinner the other night, and he said, yeah, I'm in Paris, France, and I can pull up my phone right now and look at the status of any order on any truck anywhere in the United States right now. And that's pulling directly from their Swift cluster. So they're also using this with their other additional compute uh, instances. They're um, putting all of their backups for all their servers into their Swift cluster as well. So basically what they have is a flexible storage, highly available, uh, flexible, scalable, and highly available storage system um, that is able to be used for their, uh, the, the consolidated storage for their unstructured data within their company. So that's one that I'm, I'm pretty excited about. Oh, and also, it's spread all over North America. So they've got lots of locations in different ways, and they can actually have um, a DR, disaster recovery uh, failure scenario, uh, that they keep the data available even in the midst of losing an entire data center. So speaking of hardware and where it can be deployed and things like that, what kind of stuff does, what, what do you put Swift as software? So where does it actually run? What, what's the, what does it look like? And the advantage of, the, the nice thing here is whatever you got. So there's two examples. One, this is a very small, uh, very small five node uh, Swift cluster that's running in our lab back in our office. And this is used actually for uh, to tests on every single patch that is submitted to Swift. It's a community QA cluster. Um, but what I like about this is this is uh, using the new Intel Aviton chip that is a system on a chip that's low powered, but it's got a lot of connectivity on it. So in one U, they've got 12 drives, and we're using the HDST Helion, uh, not Helion, Helium drives, sorry, the six terabyte uh, drives in there. Um, and then this one U unit has four one gig ports and uh, two 10 gig ports, and it's all in a 400 watt power supply. Um, that's including the drive. So it's, it's very dense, very low power, um, and just very well connected on the network. Um, so this is one thing that we've got running right now. Um, if you submit a patch to Swift, your code's going to go run on there and uh, be validated with the tests. Another thing, if you're thinking about uh, more of a, uh, a larger or more dense setup, you could go for just uh, some sort of 4U JBOD or something like that. Um, put in, um, uh, for example, things from uh, Silicon Mechanics uh, and those sorts of vendors. You don't have to buy these giant um, proprietary pieces of hardware in order to run Swift. Um, if your preferred vendor is vendor X, then you can use vendor X, and that's OK. So when you're building out your Swift clusters, this is one, one way you might want to do that. Uh, this is a picture, a little high-level network diagram of how uh, you might lay out your, your initial deployment, an initial small deployment of Swift. And in this case, we've got three racks. In one rack, I've got a couple of proxy servers. I'll, I'll go into detail about how these pieces work in a moment. Uh, we've got a couple of proxy servers. And in the other rack, we've got some of our storage nodes. This is where you'd have those, basically, your hard drives. And then at the top, you've got a load balancer and your, your agger switches and your top of rack switches and things like that. So uh, the advantage of Swift is that because you've got different components of the system, uh, you're able to uh, expand where you need it. Uh, which means that if you needed to add some more capacity, you can just add another rack that looks like that, and that can be your thing. Just roll in your rack, plug it in, and you're good to go, right? And then you can add a little bit more capacity on your proxy server. Or another way you can do this is you could actually backfill your existing capability. So if you needed another expansion level, you could put in um, some more storage across your existing racks. And the nice thing about this is that, and we'll cover, uh, talk about this in a little bit, is that because these racks are, behind, are in different actual physical failure domains, they have a different 
top of rack switch, you are actually protected um, from, uh, you still have your data available to you and durably stored, even if you lose an entire rack, uh, which is pretty cool. I was talking to uh, Tom Fifield uh, the other day, and that was a tech community manager, and he used to run some uh, Swift clusters in Australia. And he would say, yeah, we'd regularly walk into the data center giving a tour and say, oh yeah, here's our Swift cluster, and pull the power out of one of the servers, just as a demo on a production server. And you're just like, whoa, no, don't do that. And he's like, the hardware's under warranty, that's fine. And Swift is going to take care of it, and it just works. That's the way it's supposed to be. So that was just kind of one of those fun little anecdotes that, yeah, it's, it's fun to handle all of that kind of stuff. So how does it do that? Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the, how Swift is put together. So to start with, Swift has a REST-based API. Basically, this means that it uses standard HTTP response codes and verbs to talk to it which means that it's speaking the language of the web. This is basically what a, a reference to something in Swift looks like. It starts, of course, with standard HTTP or HTTPS, talking to your domain, um, and then we've got the V1 protocol. We've always had V1 um, for the past five years or so. Um, and then there's three important pieces of Swift. You've got an account, a container, and an object. So the account is not necessarily user identity. Uh, that's, that's different. Uh, account is really a place where you can store your data. And so it can be treated in a couple of different ways. If, for example, you go to HP or Rackspace or, or SoftLayer and sign up for a public Swift uh, account, or you, you buy the service from them, you will get, your identity will get access to a Swift account. Perhaps one in different regions or things like that. But on a Swift cluster, you will get an account. Now, another way that I've seen this happen is that you may have an account per application. So here's my document management application, and that's going to have a Swift account, and then I'm going to be able to do stuff inside of that. So the account stores a little bit of aggregated metadata, how many bytes are total, how many objects, and how many containers total do you have. And you can also set some user metadata on it as well. This account was created on Tuesday by Bob, you know, whatever you need to do there. Inside of the account, you can create containers. And containers similar to folders, except you can't nest containers. And the containers similarly contain or a little bit of uh, metadata and either user settable and some aggregated metadata for the system. And they also contain a list of all of the objects inside of them. And containers are unique to your account so that I can ha have an images a container and you can have an images container and that's okay. Uh, they will not conflict. Then inside of containers is where the data goes, and those are your objects' names. So if you're using, uh, if you're using Swift to store pictures of cats, because the, um, the internet is for cat pictures, then your cat.jpg is your object that's stored there, and that's what that looks like. So when you're talking to Swift, again, you're using standard HTTP, HTTP verbs and response codes, just like almost everything else in, in OpenStack. So if you want to write a new object, that's a put to the object name, and you give it the data. That's it. If you want to get it back, if you want to read it, to get to that same object name, and you get it back, and it's good. One of the really great things about the fact that this is basically speaking the same la native language as the web is that it means it really integrates very, very well, both on the client side, meaning that you can have a web browser talk directly to Swift, and even on the operational side, it means that it's really easy to put in existing tools that you can just get off the shelf from anywhere else. So you have some really hot content, you need a caching solution, Great, you can put Varnish or Squid or whatever you want on top of this because they already know how to speak HTTP, so you can easily have that content um, cached. In fact, that's actually what Wikipedia does. They have their Swift cluster and they've got some caching layers um, to do some stuff there. Uh, and that's, it just works very well. You don't have to worry about having a custom solution for your particular problem that it's the same problem that everybody else has. So, uh, that is a good question. Um, I, I will answer that one now. Um, the, the question was about deletes. Uh, I, I think in general what I'll say is that when you are able to, in Swift, with the Swift API, you can overwrite a particular object. So I can write it one time, and then I can use the same name and put new data on that. That's fine. And if you delete it, then you will delete that object name, and that will be gone. It's not, there's the, we do have the feature inside of Swift for versioned writes, so you can kind of push it down on a stack, and then a delete will pop the stack. 
Um, but without enabling that particular feature for a particular container, then you will, um, any data in there, if you delete it, it's, it's gone. That's, that's what you ask it to do. So here are the basic parts of Swift. It's a very simple, very simple diagram. Uh, the user talks to a proxy server. Proxy servers talk to storage nodes. The proxy server is responsible for handling the user requests, of course, implementing most of that API, and then coordinating all the communication with the storage nodes. The proxy server isn't, doesn't have any storage in and of itself. Uh, it doesn't have any drives attached to it or anything like that. Uh, really, it's shuffling packets and making sure that uh, failure, failure scenarios in the, in the cluster are handled. The storage nodes are where the data is written. And basically, there's three different kinds of storage nodes generally put together on a deployment. Um, where there's different ways to do that. Um, the object, the container, and the account. And those match to the con account container and object um, in the API. Again, I hinted at this earlier, but the nice thing about this design is it gives you a modular design where you, you can, if you need more, you can add more. So if you need more storage nodes, you can add more storage nodes. And you can do that independently of adding new proxy nodes. If you needed more client connectivity, and bandwidth and things like that, you can add more proxy servers. And you don't have to go buy new hard drives to do that. And so normally, a cluster is going to look like several proxy servers put behind some sort of load balancer um, talking to a set of storage nodes. And what this means is that you've get, you get a very highly scalable system that actually improves as it gets bigger, because there's more pieces that fit together or that help offload any sort of problems that you may have. I mean, hard drives fail quite a bit. So you want to, um, you want to make sure you have the entire cluster helping uh, handle those sort of failures. And um, it means that as you add more, and then you add a lot more, um, your cluster is linearly scalable. So if you need more, there's, there's none of these pieces share any state. So there's no central metadata layer that is kind of a bottleneck for everything. So it means that if you need more, Things, you can add more things just exactly where you need it. There's no single, because of that, there's also no single point of failure in the system, which means that if you pull the power out of a rack or a particular server, then it automatically works around that and can fail it. It's also the same thing if you need to upgrade something. You can upgrade one piece of the entire cluster while the rest of it is continuing to be, uh, continuing to run. Even if it's patching a kernel and having to restart, that um, restart is basically like pulling the power because it's now not available. So you can so you can easily have these operational methodologies that just assume this cluster is going to stay healthy and it's going to uh, keep running. So if that happens, if you've got all of these systems, you've got all of these different uh, storage servers out there uh, doing all of this, um, uh, placing uh, placing the data throughout the entire cluster. How does Swift know where to do that? So there's a few different ways. Hold that thought just a minute. Swift is optimized <laughs> for, uh, for being highly concurrent. Um, what this means is that uh, it's not going to be optimized for a single stream throughput, but you can do 10,000 streams at once sort of thing. So Swift is basically built for scale and optimized for durability. You're not going to lose your data. Availability, which means that even if half your cluster falls over, you can still read and write from it. And availability, which means that, I'm sorry, I already said availability. Um, concurrency across the entire data set, which means that especially when you have things that deal with lots of web content or mobile data, user-generated content, um, all of that is uh, aggregating, aggregating that throughput together is how Swift scales, rather than saying, I'm going to do 10,000 re uh, requests to one particular video, we're going to do 10,000 videos at once, or whatever the number is for your use case. So data placement, that's where we were going earlier, so sorry about that. Uh, how does Swift know where to put the data? There's basically two things you can know. You can two questions you can ask about any storage system, and when you get the answers to those, you'll know a whole lot about how that system works and where the failure modes are going to be. Those questions are first, how do, how do you do data placement, and number two, how do you handle failures? So let's talk about uh, data placement. Swift uses something called a consistent hashing ring to place your data. A hashing ring is a sort of complicated topic, but we're all kind of familiar with the concept of hashing things up into different buckets. You can think about that from an encyclopedia perspective of an encyclopedia. Uh, if you need to go look for an entry on flowers, you go look in F. 
If you're going to go look for an octopus, you go look for O. It's the same way with Swift. But instead of doing it based on kind of the, the, the problem with this kind of naive ha uh, hashing and bucketing of your data is that not everything starts with a Q. Not everything, not too many things start with an X. And so you have une uneven sizes of things. So there's a way you can kind of, uh, you, can, you can get better than that. So here is basically what a consistent hash ring looks like. You take a hash function that is going to distribute your data when you, when you pass in something. Uh, this is something like MD5 or SHA-256, SHA or murmur hash or these other things that have this uh, uh, a good distribution of bits. You put something in, you get, you get shuffled bits out. Um, as, a, as a quick footnote here, I want to point out that we are using these hashing functions only for splaying data and not for security purposes, so don't get scared when I say we use MD5. Um, <laughs> it gives very good data distribution. That's what we're using it for. So the point is, um, what happens is when you hash something, you get a big number. And if you get the biggest number possible and you add one, you basically loop back around to zero, which gives you the concept of a ring, because you can keep going around and around and around it. So what happens is if you have a basic uh, consistent hashing ring, you will hash some characteristic, some unique characteristic about each of the things that are represented in the rings. In this case, we've got a couple of different nodes. And so we hash them, and it's basically random locations throughout the ring. And then we want to find out where something lives. We take something, say a hilarious cat photo, and we hash that, and we realize this is where it lives on the ring. That's where it maps to. And at that point, then, you start walking around the ring. Sorry about that. Uh, you start walking around the ring until you get to something. So in this example here, this hilarious cat photo will be mapped to node one, because that's the first thing it encountered. So you can see that it's not a very even distribution around here, but uh, it does work. And especially as you get more and more things, it kind of averages out. But you still have to walk around the ring, and that, that had some complexity and some slowness on things. So you can do a little bit better. So Swift does a little bit better and evenly divides that hash ring into even size partitions, just pieces of the key space. So in this case, when we hash something, we get out that big number, some big long stream of bits, and we can take a prefix of those bits and do a direct lookup and say that, oh, that directly maps to node one. So in that case, is nice, fast, constant time lookup, and we get nice, even uh, placement around that. Now, inside of Swift, we've done uh, a few more things, which is uh, kind of nice. Um, when we, when we place the data, uh, we place it according to a hierarchy of failure, do failure domains. And at the very top, you've got a region. Under, regions can have zones inside of them, and zones have servers, and servers have drives. So ultimately, data lives on the drives. So we need to make sure that it goes well across the drives. So when something is placed into Swift, we choose a subset of those drives. In a triple replicated sense, you're going to have three replicas you're going to choose. And that's going to be placed as uniquely as possible. So in this example here, we've got a lot of drives. We've got four servers. And in this case, every, sing uh, every replica is placed on a unique server because we have enough servers to do that. And we know that we can see that there are two replicas in one zone and one replica in the other. Because we only have two zones, we've got three replicas to place. So that, that makes sense. And in this case, they're all in the same geographic region. And if you added more, if you, if you go wide on your deployment, then you get a wider dis, uh, placement of your data. So the next thing uh, to talk about, I, I said earlier, is failure, failure domains. So as of right now, and I'll cover this in a little bit, uh, Swift is a replicated storage system, which means that we're storing multiple copies of your data um, for durability and availability, which gives you very nice, cheap recoveries. It gives you... Uh, easy reads and writes without having to have a lot of CPU behind those. And um, it's really good, especially for a lot of the web and mobile and smaller content that people uh, store. So we are working on erasure codes right now. That's something that's in development. We're actually going to be talking about that quite a bit uh, tomorrow during the design sessions. Uh, and we've been working on it for a while already. Uh, it's based on top of the concept of storage policies that we have inside of Swift that are part of the Juno release. We also continually ensure dur uh, durability of the data by checksumming it and ensuring that it still matches the same checksum as when it was originally stored, which means that you're protected against bit rot, you are protected against file system corruption, you know, maybe the power was lost in the middle of a write. I don't know why that would happen. Maybe there was a tour in the DC that day. 
Um, and so it will, it will automatically check that, and it will do that every, uh, in the background con uh, continuously, and also every time the data is read in, in response to a, a read request, it will validate again that that's done. Now, what happens if something fails, or uh, actually, which way did I go there? Yeah, so the auditor is always running in the background and checking that, and if something fails, if there has been failure, then that's gonna be moved out of the way. It's gonna be quarantined. So that particular bad copy of the data is, is now out of the way and not going to be served to the user at all. And then the way we fix that is with replication. So we've got a replicator process that runs in the background and notices um, it's, it's a push-based model so that one particular server can look on its local drives and determine this is the data that is on my drives. What data is now supposed to be on my drives that I have? Okay, that's great, but there's these other things that aren't. Or let's make sure that the other, um, I, I find a particular piece of data, where are the other places it's supposed to be? Check with them to make sure that they have it. And if they don't, push it out there. Which means that, for example, if the, if the auditor quarantines a particular object, then um, one of the other replicas will notice that, oh, this one doesn't have it anymore, push it back over there. And therefore, um, that entire, that's happening continuing in the cluster, and the entire, the entire cluster is participating in, in, uh, in rebuilding failures. Uh, if you lose an entire drive and put in a blank, unformatted drive, it'll automatically fill it back up um, from the entire cluster, which means that it happens quickly, it doesn't overwhelm your system, and it works really well. So, Swift and OpenStack. I uh, started uh, off with this. Swift is one of the, as you know, is one of the founding projects of OpenStack. Um, and um, one of the things I love about being at these design summits is the fact to uh, being able to closely work with the other people so that it integrates um, well with Keystone. We have Keystone V3 support in Juno now. Um, it integrates well with Solometer and uh, Glance and the other projects that need a place to store large-scale application data. So. As I said, I work for a company called SwiftStack. We do a little bit more uh, beyond Swift, but not modifying Swift itself. Just a very quick overview. Um, we, we sell uh, monitoring and management servers, uh, support. I'm sorry, monitoring and managing, excuse me. We sell monitoring and management software for Swift so that you can know what's going on in your, in your cluster and how to take care of it. We also have a GIF file system gateway that you can put on top of Swift so you can speak to Swift through SIFS or NFS. So you can talk, to, you can integrate with OS systems if you're using um, and, and your existing um, uh, monitoring and alerting. And, and so it works, it, it seamlessly integrates into your existing IT infrastructure. So if you want to know more info at this point, which of course I hope you do, then there's a lot of places you can go. So if you want a very detailed overview, if that's a thing, then uh, check out uh, swiftstack.com slash openstackswift. Uh, it's probably the best single page on the internet of here's all you need to know about Swift with diagrams and pictures and links to videos and things like that. Of course, you can find the API docs with the OpenStack API docs. Uh, if you are interested in being a contributor, love to have you join in. And we hang out on OpenStack Swift channel on Freenode. Uh, my nickname there is not my name, so I'd be happy to help out and answer questions and things like that. Of course, you can get the book. Um, and again, I think the expo hall closed. Um, uh, go to swiftstack.com slash book, and you can request a copy there. Uh, you can get it both uh, in uh, book form and also electronic form. Um, SwiftStack also allows you to get a, uh, a free trial for dev and test, so you can just go download that, see it run the software yourself easily, easily, very, very quickly, get up and running, um, and have a Swift cluster that you can now play with and see what happens. And then uh, we have a, a SwiftStack Videos YouTube channel that will uh, let you, uh, we're going to put all the recordings from uh, the Swift-related sessions up on there and uh, things from elsewhere in the ecosystem. Uh, try to track those and put, put a lot of info there. So it's a great place to spend a few hours on videos. So at that point, what questions do you have? Um, I'd be happy to answer anything for the next mm, about five minutes. Um, OK, two questions. So the availability zones, are those kind of arbitrary like in Nova, or are those, do you, does Swift expect that to be kind of mapped to some real physical thing? OK, great question. The, I expect that the availability zones, um, zones for short, um, are representative of your physical failure domains. 
So it's not an arbitrary grouping. It actually should reflect the fact that you've got actually different racks or different rows or different utility power supply or different DC rooms or even different, different DCs in a metro area. And if you don't have different physical failure domains, then you use one zone. If you're putting a Swift cluster in just one rack and it's all behind the same top rack switch and the same power supply, then that's just one zone. And that's OK. Swift will completely take care of that. Um, but as you add more, it will continue to grow out. But it's up to the Swift administrator to say which storage nodes are in which zones. Kind exactly. Of so what happens is when you're creating the cluster and when you add capacity to the cluster, you're adding hard drives, basically, storage volumes. And so when you do that, you add the, what identifies that to the data placement is this is the, the name of the drive. It's on this particular server in this zone in this region. And you add that piece of information, and then there you go. And then my other one was, could you talk a little bit about how the how the hashing algorithm, the placement algorithm handles when you add in more hosts to this thing, like mm -hmm. how it reshuffles or whatever? Yeah, good question. So how does consistent hashing deal with the rebalancing of data? So the idea is I have 99 hard drives. Let's just assume, because it's easy, that they're all 4 terabyte hard drives, all equally sized. So at that point, I add in another 4 terabyte hard drive. Now I have 100 total. What happens at that point, and there's the really great thing about consistent hashing, is that the amount of data that's moved around is proportional, directly proportional, to the amount of capacity that you added. So in this case, Swift is going to move about 1% of your data because you added about 1% capacity. Um, and that's, that's the reason you choose consistent hashing. It means that um, if you plug in a new rack, and a second rack, then you can gradually add that and you increase its weight in the system so that it will gradually move things over. And then um, it won't immediately, it won't cause downtime because it's automatically overwhelmed your networking because everything's like, ah, we've got to put everything over here. Uh, now let's put it back or something like that. It's, it's going to go gradually. It's only going to be proportional to the amount of capacity you're adding. So uh, again, that's one of the uh, examples of kind of gets a little bit better the bigger it gets. Because if you've got 10 hard drives and you add one, well, now you've got roughly 10% of your capacity you just added. But if you've got a petabyte and you're adding in just another server, well, that's almost a non-event. You just kind of put it in there and it takes care of it automatically. Anything over here? So based on your experience, uh, what you've seen in the industry, do customers create separate backups for this? For the objects, I know there is three blocks and all mm -hmm. to recover, but you know, do they create still right? Additional so backups? I won't lie to you that I've definitely had people ask me, "How do I back up my Swift cluster?" Which the answer is generally, "Well, get another Swift cluster." Uh, <laughs> that's that's more facetious than than practical. Um, no, you don't really need to back up Swift because Swift is a durable storage system. It would be backing up your backups um, because Swift has. Uh, replicated storage and soon erasure codes. Um, it is storing those across those failure domains, automatically managing and handling failures in your hardware, uh, or software for that matter, and uh, ensuring that it's durable and available. So you could, but you're not really gaining a lot from that. It would be tricky. It, it, it's one of those things, I mean, Swift is built for petabytes of data, so it's like, I don't need to. 20 petabyte backup. So where do I put that? Another 20 petabyte Swift cluster. That sort of thing. At, rest At rest encryption. That is a good question. So uh, actually, that wasn't a question. That was three words. <laughs> so OK, so uh, what about encryption? The way Swift works today is that you hand it bytes. It dutifully stores those bytes on disk. You ask for the bytes back, and it's going to give them back to you just as you stored them. So if you need to store encrypted data, the end-to-end -end principle says that you should encrypt the data and then store it in Swift. That way you know that it's encrypted. On the other hand, there are other use cases that say, well, we don't control the application necessarily, but we still need to have this data at rest encryption. So uh, you can mount Swift on top of encrypted volumes. You have seen little cards from vendors that encrypt the SAS channel or, or SATA, SATA bus. Um, or you could uh, put it on top of Lux volumes or something like that. Um, another thing we are actually working on, and this is kind of the third point there, is adding in the ability to have some encryption inside, uh, encryption in the Swift proxy, um, so that it will encrypt as it goes through. 
and the decrypt on it goes out, which means that you get the advantages of fast deletes and you can, um, uh, you can have untrusted or unknown clients connecting that you know, the data is still going to be uh, encrypted. I think we have time for one more. Unfortunately, I, I have another talk immediately after this, so I have to, it's only one more. Third question, actually. Uh, there are no limits in the Swiss code on how many objects can be put in uh, the container, but are there any practical ones? That is a good question. Uh, there are, you are correct that there are no limits that on any, on the cardinality of objects that you have inside of a particular container or even just in the cluster overall. Uh, but are there any practical limits? It is highly dependent upon your particular infrastructure and use case. Uh, the, if you have high cardinality of, uh, of objects inside of a particular container, and I'm thinking on the order of many millions of objects, at that point, uh, you, you may not be able to sustain as many writes per second to that particular container, but it completely does not affect any other container, and it completely does not affect the read path. So it only is if I have to sustain a thousand puts per second to a particular container. At that point, then I need to appropriately size my container and size my hardware so that I have enough scale to, to deal with that sort of thing. And that's, again, the, the advantage of the modular design is you can actually improve those particular pieces and do that, and your application can appropriately splay the data across. Because remember, Swift is designed for concurrency across the entire data set. So use that. Use that. In fact, I'm going to be talking about that in my next talk in about five minutes. So thank you very much. Have a good day.